understand what I'm about to tell you, you need to do something first. You need to believe in the impossible. Can you do that? What do you desire that you can't have? When I eat a brain, I get visions. Don't ever come back to Gotham. You have failed this city. Jesus, what kind of a preacher are you? There's about a dozen ways that I could stop you right now. But I don't think I have to. Because where I'm from, your grandson becomes the greatest hero in the universe. Now you should at least give your brother a moment to say something heroically clever. In the future, my friends may not be heroes, but if we succeed, they will be remembered as legends. Welcome to the DC TV Report for the week ending Saturday, June 23rd, 2018. I'm Edward O'Hare, nicknamed to be determined. And I'm Sarah Netsley, academic by day, freelance writer by night. We're here to bring you recaps, news, and commentary for all live action television shows based on DC Comics. And we have one episode for you this week. It is a finale. We're saying goodbye. Yeah. Aw, bye bye. For now. <laughs> <laughs> and just to the one show. I mean, we're not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. And we, we do have a retro pick. A good retro pick. An exciting retro pick. <laughs> All right. So, how are you doing, Sarah? Good. I'm doing well. My uh, my summer is shaping up, because I, I teach and I'm off over the summer, uh, shaping mm-hmm. up to be a summer of organization where I've moved into a new house and I finally have time to actually get things the way I want them rather than just being like, I don't know, shove it in a drawer. I'll deal with it later. Ed, do you know what I did yesterday for three hours? What's that? I took an enormous box from the junk drawer for my old house and I tried every last pen and if it didn't work i threw it away and if it did work i separated it into like pen type and color i may need more to do that may have been a cry for help actually as i'm saying this out loud i realize i'm a stepford wife someone help me oh god Uh, how are you doing (laughs) i'm okay i have about I have about six months of non DC TV shows to to binge over the summer. So, do you want to get like a kickstart on that for me? I'm in the middle of Shannara Chronicles right now. <laughs> oh um, God, Shannara! Oh, the beautiful elves! Oh, the beautiful shirtless elves! <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I'm I'm taking my mom to see uh, the Mister Rogers documentary. Uh, Will you be my neighbor tomorrow? Um, first of all i will be Uh, and second of all you'll have to let us know how that is because that i mean how can it it's about the most pure and good person this planet has ever seen so i'm assuming it's going to be great i i well you can hear my you'll probably be hearing my thoughts on uh on this week's episode of the wicked theory podcast well i look forward to Um, that cool 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 so uh yeah 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 things things to do you want you want to just jump right into this episode you want to just get things kicked off Let's fly right in. All right, here we go. Supergirl, season three finale. Battles lost and won. Mern gave on the memories of Mars creation and sacrificed himself to stop Rain's terraforming. Samantha encountered Patricia in the Dark Valley while trying to find the Fountain of Life and weaken Rain. Brainy explained to mon that stopping Pestilence had freed his tech-savvy ancestor and offered Wynne the chance to go back to the 31st century in his place. James kept taking his mask off and felt really good about it. Last-minute reveal, Lena advised Eve Tessmacher to begin Phase 2 of their work on Harun L., and a doppelganger of Kara mysteriously approached a military installation in Siberia. That was a busy episode. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, can I make a tortured metaphor? Go for it. All right. The Atlanta Olympics, 1996. Oof. Carrie Strug, plucky little Carrie Strug, did a thing and sprained her ankle and it came down to she was the only one who could win america the gold and so she ran down the the vault ramp thing with her bad ankle and she did it and she stuck the landing and and 
USA, USA. Okay, that was Supergirl in the finale. <laughs> Supergirl had a bad self-inflicted sprained ankle. Supergirl had to get over the closing. They had to go for the gold here. It's the finale. So Supergirl runs at the vault, does it, you know, sticks the landing. Was it perfect? No, but it was enough for, I mean, I'm not going to say like Olympic gold, but I feel like for all the frustration I had with the back half of the season, this is a pretty good finale. Yeah. Would you like to out torture my metaphor there? <laughs> oh, oh, well, if we're going sports, this is this is like Doc Gooden's no hitter where he had like eight walks, but still no one got a hit. No one hit the ball and got on base. So it counts as a no hitter. There you go. We're appealing to really different fandoms with these metaphors. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I wasn't sure what Supergirl was going to do because they'd been kind of all over the place in terms of how they were pulling off the different storylines. All in all, I I left feeling good about where the characters were. My heart was warmed. I don't know that everything was perfect and maybe things could have been different, but I just I left feeling pretty good about things, which is nice. It's nice. It was nice. Yeah. Yeah. I thought they wrapped it up nicely. Uh, I I thought it was a bold but necessary move to um, end your your strongest storyline of the season, which was which was Mern, um, to have that end in, you know, the first 10 minutes. Um, but, you know, again, it, that was the most effective way to end that. And, you know, in order for the episode to pro in order for the episode to work. Um, if they weren't going to give us a full standalone episode to say goodbye to him, that was a good way to do it. I still think I probably would have sobbed harder if we'd had a full episode mostly devoted to that. But I'm glad they gave him those those beats in that moment, even if it was kind of early on. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. It was good. Yeah, yeah. And I, I do feel like, you know, even if it was a small moment, every character did get a moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't feel like there's any storylines that were left hanging, like everything got its due. And even if something wasn't fully resolved, we at least, you know, have, have a peek as to, as to where it's going to go next season. For sure. I am surprised by how happy I was for Wynn, but how much I'm probably going to miss him next season. For somebody who didn't have a ton of really centrally grounded stories this season. I always enjoy having Wynn around. And so I think it's super cool the way his character got kind of his dream come true. He's a savior of the future with his technology in his brain. He gets to go to the future. That's exciting. But I'm going to miss him. Couldn't they have taken James? <laughs> Can I interest you in a mediocre media magnate? Instead of a tech genius, remember he, he doesn't like wearing masks. <laughs> remember, he's an interim media magnate. <laughs> Even better, they don't really need him at Catco. <laughs> he lifts right out. <laughs> remember that was supposed to be temporary, and it's been like two years now. Oh my god! Yeah, just bring back Cat Grant. Um, so, did James really need to take off his mask to comfort that woman? Did his humanity help calm her down in that moment? No, but I, I as I no. said, <laughs> it made James feel really good. <laughs> and that's what matters in super superheroics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I understand what they're going for. You understand the objective, but I don't I don't really know if it achieves that. Um no, but it got him to where they wanted to be with him in the end. So yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, he's he's retiring from vigilantism now. Like that's because <laughs> also that that mask, you know, it it yeah, it's a mask, but it it more functions as a helmet and like <laughs> protection and like you know, so like even if he decides to go out, he's still got to have that over his face. And then I guess he just pops it out every once in a while and go, hey, you don't want to hit me, man. Like, you know, like all of a sudden hey, he's, a, he's a California surfer. Um, I'm a person. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I am excited for more Brainy. I, I'm pleased that that actor, that character is going to be a regular next season. He was fun. I, I'll be curious how he does in larger doses on the show. But uh Ed, did you did you lose your mind at the Brainiac reference? Like Brainiac OG? Yes. Yeah. And like, because you can't just leave that hanging. Like, 
there has to be a point sometime next season where things get really out of hand and they've got to, they've got to bring Kara into the future to help. Um, and uh, I, I'm really excited to see how the Supergirl Brainiac stacks up against the Krypton Brainiac. <laughs> I hope they do that. I'm worried that it was, we have to have some excuse to move Win out. So let's throw in an Easter egg for fans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. You, you, and that it won't be visited again. You, 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 you can't just drop that name. <laughs> you can't. That is, that is the biggest checkoff gun of all checkoff guns. <laughs> By the way, you gave me the tools I needed to. Well, actually, someone in the comments of my EW.com recap that I did all season long. If you've enjoyed my Supergirl talk here, check me out on EW.com. But in the comments, somebody said to answer your question, uh, Brainy is actually Brainiac Five, and he has no relationship with the original Brainiac. They're just from the same planet. And I sat on that for a second, and I was like, no, I'm not going to put up with this. <laughs> well, actually, I know it's Brainiac 5, and he is a descendant of Brainiac, or in some iterations, a Brainiac clone. Don't come for me. I will sick Ed on you. I didn't say that, but like, <laughs> I knew if I needed you, I could throw up the DC TV bat signal, and you'd be there. You'd be there for me. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I would be there right after Bauer Fett jumped in front of me. Um <laughs> <laughs> He would take all the bullets for us. I will go down fighting. Uh, but no, I was I was very polite about it. I'm never defensive or anything like that. I'm not a jerk. But I just I was like, no, nah, no, nah, no, nah, dude. I got this. I know. I know. I know things. Thanks to Ed. I listen to Ed every week. I know things. Well, I'm glad I'm helping. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ed, helping win arguments on the internet. Yeah, since. yeah. I, it's funny how like we haven't really talked about the main story arc of this episode, which is which is <laughs> all right, rain. Yeah, rain and <laughs> Sam in the dark valley, and and I am sorry. I'm sorry. Patty cannot get off like that. That is no. <laughs> they retcon that character. No, no. <laughs> Just uh, like the whole time I'm I'm watching this on screen, I'm just no, 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 no. You you well, do. I you, truly thought her, her last action was going to be to lead Sam to the wrong water because she was so awful in the first episode we saw of her. Yeah, uh, like like to me, like you've got to you've got to take that bowl and like throw it at her, just like <laughs> <laughs> just like drown her in the fountain she's trying to get you to drink out of. You know, like it just ah. Uh, it didn't fly for me. I'm sorry. Me either. Mm-hmm. Nope. That was the one happy ending that I didn't need the show to give me at all. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Uh, I did like that the show killed Rain in two super 90s ways. The first time around, Rain dies in the cauldron of fire like a Terminator. Yes. <laughs> and the second time around in the valley, black wraiths carry her away like the end of Ghost. So really great shout out show. That was weird. I didn't expect it, but well done. Someone's a fan. <laughs> Someone's a real fan of like 1992. I think like 91, 92, like that stretch. When was Ghost? Was Ghost was Ghost late eighties or early nineties? I think it was early nineties. I feel like it was super early nineties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There had to be like, was there like a song that was on both soundtracks or like like a, a you know an artist? Like there has to be some connection there, or maybe are we are we playing Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon with this? Yeah, or maybe it was just like, did Patrick Swayze and Arnold Schwarzenegger have the same hairstyle? I can't. No, Swayze had better hair. Um, I feel like Edward Furlong in Terminator Two. And Demi Moore and Ghost had the same haircut, actually. <laughs> and Ghost was 90 and Terminator 2 was 91. Okay. All right. For what it's worth. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, um, I, wh- what do you think? Was, was Rain's defeat, I mean, did that feel satisfying to you? Did it feel epic enough? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was happy with the action in this. I thought, I thought that was really, really cool. The, the only thing, like I said, was that was the way they, they had Patricia play into it. Like I, I, I <laughs> yeah. Like I feel if, if any of that, it should have been a ghost of Ruby. Um, or oh, else. same. Can you imagine Ruby guiding her to the right thing? Oh, that mm-hmm. would have been great. Yeah. Yeah. Like it should have been Ruby and it was a trick. Like it should have been. She was trying to get her to drink from the other one. I'm sorry. I'm pulling a Mark Bernard in here. I'm. I'm. 
uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, I was, I was, I was, I was happy with that. And I, I'm really happy with the way they've laid it out for this season. I feel like flash, uh, is just like adding more characters on and Supergirl and arrow are trying to lean things out of it. But Supergirl, I think is doing the best at it. Whereas like, Win and Monel are in the future now, and John is John is walking the earth like kung fu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, yeah. He's pulling a cane in kung fu. Um, and uh, and yeah, yeah, and you know, Lena is doing whatever. You know, Alex, Alex is getting that promotion, and it's like, yeah, you're in a promotion of a job, a supervisory job. That's what's going to allow you to have a kid. Um, is that. <laughs> Um, you know, I would believe that becoming the director is going to allow her to have a safer job if we hadn't seen John go into the field literally every week. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. that, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but like you could you could see the story arcs playing out and uh, yeah, you know, so I'm 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 good with that. So the Manel arc was interesting to me because uh, I'm not sure what the show intended to do with that. So they bring him back and it's like, oh, this is his chance to reconnect with Kara. They had to say goodbye. Long lost loves. No, he's married. Oh, but he might be getting a hall pass. Oh, and now he's going back to the future and nothing is, huh. Very strange. It didn't follow any cliche track that I was expecting. I will say, I think it worked actually because it was a bookend of the season two finale where they had to say goodbye and they didn't have any choice and it was rushed and it was panicky this time, you know, they went in and they were able to have a conversation about, I, you know, I, I care about you. My marriage is over, but I still have to do this. I still have to go to the future and do this. And I just thought it was a nice way of showing the personal growth and the way they were making their choices, but it was just very strange to bring Manel back for that. I don't know that that was closure we needed necessarily, but I don't know. Yeah, Manel is gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he's 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 uh he's Yeah, yeah. I mean, it it it, it did fulfill that arc. I mean, they they I think they said somewhere that they intended for him to be there for two seasons and they kind of fulfilled that. It it is it it, it did come full circle. Um and uh yeah, I do think that the Legion's role this season was kind of a half measure. I, I, I mm-hmm. wish that we could have seen them bust out their powers. I wish we could have seen maybe a couple more Legion members, but for what it was, it, you know, it, it wasn't bad. I thought, I thought, on, you know, on balance, it worked. Yeah. And maybe we'll get more Legion members when Kara has to go into the future to fight OG Brainiac. Oh yeah. 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 Let's, let's see who we get, who we get. Do we get, do we get a uh, chameleon boy or bouncing boy or uh shadow lass? Um, yeah, there's there's a those are, the, wow, those are some names. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh you. So are we? Are we? Sh- oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, you have no idea. You have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> does bouncing? But does he? Is he like a bouncy house? Is he? Does he himself bounce? Does he bounce things? He's a fat guy. <laughs> so it's sensitive. So it's really sensitive depictions. He's, he's a fat guy who bounces around like a beach ball. That oh my God. that's he's he's the one tubby superhero. At least they don't go the Star Wars route of calling him Porkins, so I guess that's good. <laughs> he's you guys, you know my name is Jeff. It's not cool. It's bouncing boy. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm saying if he was in Star Wars, he'd be like bouncing lard or something like that. Lard lad. He would be lard lad. I mean, the only reason is he's not the most pathetic superhero is because there was a superhero from an independent company in, in I think, the 60s called Fat Man the Flying Saucer. Um, <laughs> oh. Go look it up. It was drawn by C.C. Beck, the same guy who created uh, Shazam. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> Ooh. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, um, so two, two quick things. Uh, number one, can you explain to me how that time travel worked for Kara? Cause I don't understand. She flew up and then she landed at the precise moment she needed to be. Ed, explain this. Yeah. Yeah. So Brainy talked her through a time warp. 
basically, you know, she she pulled a Star Trek four. She spun around the earth. It's kind of like a Superman the movie meets Star Trek four. Spun, spun around, around the earth, then hit the right velocity in the shade of the sun to reach her maximum limit, and then pff, she just came out where she side had to. eye. I'm side eyeing all of that, but okay. Yeah. Number two, are we cruising toward Lena as the villain? Um, it certainly seems that way. Because if she had had a thought bubble that we could see as Allura was going on about how dangerous the Black Rock is and it's so good it's not going to be on Earth anymore, Lena's thought bubble would have been, um... Yeah. So I just wonder if we're headed toward true villain. Yeah, I, to me, it's it's going to be kind of... The closest, like, recent comparison I can think of it is, like, Tony Stark in Avengers Age of Ultron. Okay. Where, like, she's really trying to do good work and doesn't really understand the the tool, the tool the tools that she's playing with and how, and how really dangerous they can be. Well, um, now I just need for Brainy to be Bucky in this scenario and we're all set. Yeah. Um... <laughs> I hope they don't go full on Luther villain. I, 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 that's. I hope they keep it nuanced like that. Well, w- really, really hope. Okay, let's get to the news because I think that's gonna be able to inform my answer on that. Alrighty then. So, Supergirl ended the season with fo Kara approaching a Siberian military base. The executive producers confirm that season four is going to be their take on Red Sun. Okay. But the question is, is it going to be uh, this Kara doppelganger as a villain or will it be the Kara doppelganger more like kind of the Power Girl route? The biggest thing for me that came out of that was Power Girl is Supergirl? I didn't know that. Oh, all right. (laughs) So Power Girl is the Earth 2 version of of Supergirl. I had no idea. I feel super uninformed about this. Yeah. And then after they got rid of earth two in the eighties, they retconned her backstory to, you know, so that they could still have power girl and Supergirl. but that's the original starting point for them huh. is so. Whereas like in earth one Supergirl, you know, he treats, you know, he's kind of like a, like Superman and Supergirl are kind of, you know, they're cousins, they're sort of peers. Um, uh, in the Earth 2, uh, Power Girl gets to Earth when uh, Clark is an older man. So he's kind of more like a, like a, like an uncle than he is a, uh, than he is a cousin. And he's more of like a father figure okay. for her. Well, I guess my question is, on Earth 2, did they just have, like, super body positivity or a serious need for boob ventilation? Like, how does... Because that doesn't seem like something Cara Danvers would do. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. You know what? There's nothing I can say about... Wait, I was going to say, that's Ed realizing he can't make a single joke about this. Nope. <laughs> If you haven't seen Power Girl's costume, it's her stories are really, really funny, and she's a cool character. Um, but yeah, yeah. Just go- Google boob window. You'll no, just Google Power Girl. Don't do it on a work computer. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you might want to have parental safety on, but um. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, uh, back to Red Sun. <laughs> anyway, Red Sun. Red Sun. That was a digression. Uh, that was an Elseworlds story, a graphic novel written by Mark Miller in the early aughts. Um, and the the basic premise is: what if Superman landed in uh, Soviet Russia instead of Kansas? Uh, and that book follows, you know, it basically goes the length of the Cold War. It starts when Superman emerges in the 50s, um, set, you know, as, you know, Stalin's favorite son and follows mm-hmm. it all the way through the 80s. And Lex Luthor is the main villain 
uh, in that. And the whole idea is he, he, you know, it's the kind of thing where like he's prove, you know, he's doing everything to prove that, um, to, to stop Superman, to prove that American superiority, you know, that, that, um, Americans don't need a Superman that, that, you know, that he's not the huge advantage that everyone thinks he is. And it's kind of this weird juxtaposition and reversal of roles. Um, you know, and so it, it, it's an interesting character study. Um, I really don't know how they're going to apply that to, to this situation. Um, you can have the Lena arc, you know, mirror the Lex Luthor arc in that. Um, I just don't know if, 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 you know, there are, if Supergirl is still in America, I don't know how that's going to play out because that, that throws a completely different wrench in that story. Do you think it's worth picking up and reading Red Sun just to kind of for contrast purposes? Oh, most definitely. And it's, it's a great piece of, it's a great piece of comic, you know, it's a, it's a great comic book. So yeah, you should read that regardless, but yeah, I, I think it will <laughs> definitely be interesting to inform um, this season. Uh, to see to see how much how much they take from it, or if they just go off the premise where like she was raised in Russia, because Russia is a very different place than the Soviet Union was uh, mm -hmm. politically, mm -hmm. um, or maybe not. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say hmm. let's let's not be that show. <sighs> um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I would like a lengthy digression on geopolitical climate in 2018. Yeah. Or we could talk about uh, who's going to be coming back. Go for it. <laughs> Next season. Okay. So Chris Wood, Monel is done. He's out. As you said earlier, Ed, they always kind of planned out a two-year arc for him. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Jordan will be a recurring character. So we will see him in the future. But that's interesting to me. If we'll see Wynn, but we won't see Monel, if they're both on the Legion or Legion adjacent, it seems like they'd be a... a package deal so maybe we'll get win somehow communicating maybe we'll see him on a monitor yeah yeah I, I, on occasion or maybe we'll get the car travels to the future episode yeah it, it, yeah to me my guess is most of the time he's just going to be ahead on a view screen um which is fine yeah. i mean i'll i'll take my win how i get them mm -hmm. uh the bigger question for me my friend tanya and i were talking about this is what cw show is chris wood going to end up on next because he has gone from vampire diaries to containment now supergirl he was on the carrie diaries my personal hope is that he turns up someplace bizarre like jane the virgin which doesn't really have i mean that's <laughs> that would be a strange place for him because he does kind of outlandish big mm -hmm shows so that would be anyway right. chris would be loved by the cw uh finally <laughs> the showrunners did a post finale uh interview with tv line and talked about they they wanted to give ruby and sam a happy ending after everything they'd put them through so they they didn't actually ever want to orphan ruby and have her end up with alex damn uh they did say yeah they did say that uh odette annabelle she, they, she's not scheduled to come back but if they could bring her back for a couple of episodes next season they'd love to do that it sounds like everybody really liked working with her cool so it'd be fun to see sam again and they talked a little bit about uh you know they have things planned for jay for Lena, for John, for Brainy, and for the Brainy Kara possible relationship, romantic relationship. Mm. So it sounds like, at exactly as you said, they have streamlined the cast and they know the stories they want to tell with the cast. I, Alex is in there too. Sorry, I didn't mention her name. Uh, and so I, hopefully they have a clear direction and, and we'll be able to execute that vision really well in season four. Cool. All right. All right, that yeah. that's uh, all right. So let's uh, let's let's bullet through here. Let's get get the news for other shows. Okay, so we start with some general news, primarily about the uh, CW's Arrowverse. The Arrowverse shows are going to start premiering in the fall on Tuesday, October 9th. Okay. That's going to be the the first date that we start getting our superheroic friends back. So uh, let's see. We have The Flash and Black Lightning premiering on Tuesday, the 9th of October. And then, so let's see, Supergirl will premiere on October 14th. Uh, that's Sunday. Arrow uh, will be Monday, October 15th, followed by Legends of Tomorrow. Uh, and then iZombie will be 2019. Okay, cool. 
All right. And they're all going to start shooting over the next several weeks. It sounds like production on all of these shows are going to start uh, late June, early July, and uh, not a CW show, but Gotham is going to start shooting its final uh, series uh, in July. So everybody's going back to work soon. Sounds good. Uh, just quick, was there anything on episode counts? Uh, um, you know, I don't remember seeing anything on episode counts. Because I'm, I'm interested to see if, I, yeah, if all five shows I, are going to get 23 episodes. I saw something on Twitter that didn't have any kind of link that I thought was a reputable link mm-hmm. that listed episode numbers. And I want to say I thought some of them had like 22 or 21. It was a little less than I expected, but it wasn't oh. like coming from TV line or deadline or anything like that. So I didn't yeah. take note. I, I know that link you're talking about. It was, it was, um, it was Hokum. Um, <gasps> the internet lied to me. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. The internet didn't. So no, I don't know. Yeah. The internet <laughs> didn't lie. Whoever, whoever made that link did. It was just, yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So that's that's the general news. And then moving into specifics. Um, so we have said goodbye to Supergirl for the season. But fear not. We have a fresh episode starting up next. Well, as you're listening to this, this week uh, in the form of Preacher. Cool. So Preacher premieres, and it's Sunday, right? Sunday. Sunday, Sunday. Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> oh, that's scary. Um, so uh, we, there's a ton of, of pre-show publicity that's been going on, a lot of clips, a lot of uh, kind of teasers to make you hungry for the show. I'm sorry. I don't know why I use that <laughs> metaphor. Um, one thing I did find was IMDb lists several of the episode titles, which if you have read the books – could be a little instructive, some of them. Mm. Uh, so the premiere is called Angelville. Okay. And then we have Sons of Bitches. Ah. Gonna Hurt. Ooh. The Tombs. Oh. The Coffin. Les Enfants du Sang. I studied Spanish, not French. Okay, back off. Okay. And then the final episode that we have a name for is Hitler. <laughs> Uh, and then the last two episodes of the season don't have titles yet. And I don't know if that's because they d- haven't decided or if they would be too spoilery. Uh, but those of you who have read the books, like I said, I think you some of those indicate characters we're going to meet or scenarios we're going to see play out. And uh, I was really excited to see some of those. So preach up. Looking forward to it. Wow. Okay. Now, this is one where you know a lot more about this, show, about this property than I do. So um... I'm – low-key excited for this role reversal that we're going to have okay all right (laughs) yeah yeah cool uh okay so uh moving into shows that are on hiatus uh arrow Stephen amell says that he would like the writers to treat season seven as if it's the last season so if they have any good ideas don't hold back throw it all out there Oh, he wants to leave the show. <laughs> How do you interpret that? Yeah. Steve, it, it, he made it very clear to say, you know, we don't know that season seven is going to be the last season, but treat it like it's the last season. Subtext, oh my God, please make this the last season. I'm sure. Th- I want to see my family again. <laughs> I'm sure that's not what he meant, but it might be what he meant. Um, I mean, it could be. I, I could see him saying, you know, I know our, our audience is slipping and I know there have been some complaints. So, just don't think, oh, we can save this for season eight. We we have to mm-hmm. give it our all now. So uh, depending – if you're a glass half full or a glass half empty person, you will interpret that differently. All right. Um, he also said uh, that he thinks the show's legacy is going to be that when Green Arrow stories are told in the future after the show is done – They are going to have to include the characters that were created for the show or that were redefined on the show because they've been so integral to the Green Arrow story. So your Diggles, your Felicities, your Theas, your Sarah Lances, those characters are new or very different. And without them, do you have a Green Arrow in the future? And he says, no, the show has made them too important to ignore. I don't know. What do you think, Ed? Yeah, I mean, you know, Felicity has uh, Felicity was in the comics, but she wasn't a Green Arrow character, and she has shown up in Green Arrow comics. Diggle has played a significant role in the comics, but uh, you know, to 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 that to to that extent, I think if you if you were to do Green Arrow as a movie or in you know or or 
you know, in another property. Yeah. I think, I, I do think that those characters will have a lasting impact and it, it does, it would seem weird to do a green arrow movie and not have Felicity in it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I can definitely, I yeah. can definitely back up that statement. Yeah. It's, it's, an, it's an interesting thought exercise. Now, will we get a green arrow movie anytime in the future? Uh, that's another question. Not likely, but who knows? <laughs> it seems so. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, and, and if we do, will it be played by Ryan Reynolds? Because I just feel like <laughs> he's the go-to. <clears throat> yeah. All right. So uh, next show, The Flash. Mm. We have another bit of casting, and that is that Jessica Parker Kennedy will be a regular next season. Of course, she plays Mystery Girl, a.k.a. Nora West Allen. Okay. So not a big surprise that she would be a regular, but uh, yeah, she, that's apparently not going to be a three episodes and we're done thing. She's going to be with us for the long haul. Cool. And Candace Patton gave an interview, uh, and comicbook.com reported it, and she said a bunch of things that made me feel really bad about being so annoyed when she talks about Iris and journalism, because every time they bring up journalism and Iris, I just, I heave a sigh that ruffles the leaves on the trees a a block away because, Oh my God. But, you know, she talks about how central being a reporter is to Iris in the comics. And she doesn't like how far they've gotten from that. And she also thinks it's important to see women doing what they love rather than just being the romantic interest. And so she wants to have a little bit more agency and she wants to get out of star labs and and hopefully they'll, they'll treat that, that part of the story right next season. I would love that. I would love to not roll my eyes when Iris does journalism. I would love to stop using air quotes around journalism when I talk about it with Iris. So great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Please do that show. I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. The sentiments are all there. I just, the execution on the show has always been a little frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe just bring in David Simon for, you know, for, for a couple weeks. <laughs> You know, that, oh my god, he, he could he could, he could fix up that story arc. He could fix up that story arc. <laughs> the tonal shift. We go from Ralph Dibney's antics to Iris, like the corruption in Baltimore. We have to expose it. We have to root it out. There's systemic problems from top to bottom. I mean, he would be the one ballsy enough to have Doctor Light rape Sue Dibney, um, like before she, before she even showed up on screen. Um, <laughs> uh, so david simon if you're out there call your agent <laughs> all right but by the Moving way if, i keep I, I i keep referring to this horrible horrible it's not a horrible but very tragic and traumatic story arc it's called identity crisis if anyone wants to read it um, I honestly don't think I do. <laughs> Typically, I'm not a big fan of like rape as the woman's backstory. Uh, rarely is that handled in a way that I'm like, ooh, sign me up. But I am curious about the Ralph and Sue thing. You've talked about it enough that I, I am really yeah. interested in learning more. Yeah. Well, if you read if you read 52, you'll get you'll get a little bit of that. Yeah. Uh, so, if, if you want the full what, backstory, Identity Crisis is written by Brad Meltzer. Oh. Huh. Mm-hmm. It still blows my mind that he's a comics guy because I just think of him as a fiction book writer. <laughs> we, my big holdup, we have all these, we have all these omnibuses. They're all still in boxes. We're still working on finishing the library and unpacking. It's getting closer every day. Every day, <laughs> we're getting a little bit closer. Okay. If the plumber would just come and move that pipe so we could finish that doorway so we could st- – anyway, it's a whole thing. <laughs> All right. Le- Legends of Tomorrow. I just turned into Kara's childhood friend from a couple of episodes ago complaining about the contractor on Argo City. <laughs> That's me right now. Legends. <laughs> okay. So we have some casting news for Legends. One is Nate's father. Nate's father is going to be a recurring character in season four. We have met Nate's grandfather. We're going to meet his father now, who is described as loved by many, but not by Nate. Mm. So, uh, and we're going to get a second new regular as well. Her name is Allie. She's in her 20s. She's intelligent. She loves YA and fantasy novels. She's an animal lover. Uh, It sounds like we're not going to be hurting for many characters next season on legends all right all right and then uh katie lots who of course plays sarah lance did an interview where she talked about 
how she would like to be able to guest star on Arrow so Sarah Lance can kick some ass to avenge the death of her father. On the other hand, you know, it's she kind of went on a revenge tear when Laurel died, and that was two years ago, and she really grew over the course of those seasons into somebody who was not quite as interested in seeking vengeance. Mm. So does this, does today's Sarah need to avenge Quentin like that? It's an interesting question. She also talked a little bit about the importance of uh, Sarah as the captain of the wave rider in that important role as a female and as an, an actively bisexual woman, you know, that, that they don't just say it, they show it. And so that kind of representation in that position of power uh, can be formative and helpful and representation matters. So it was a cool interview with Katie Lutz. Cool. Yeah. All right. Moving on to Lucifer. All right. Which again, not canceled on Netflix. Super exciting. We have a little bit more information about how those episodes are going to look on Netflix. Uh, mm. They're going to stay around 43 minutes, the traditional broadcast length. They're not going to take this opportunity to be like, oh, we're going to go an hour and a half, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> that is one thing. Um, they are going to head back to work in August, which is a little later than other shows are picking up production. So we're probably not going to get that typical fall premiere for Lucifer. And the 10 episodes that we've been promised are not going to include those two bonus episodes. They're going to be 10 episodes on top of that. And uh, the showrunner said that the 10 episodes are going to cover the first half of what they had planned for season four on Fox. So they had two arcs planned for season four. They're going to do that first arc in this Netflix season. And they're not treating it as a final season. You know, they're treating it as the next season. So I thought all of that was really, uh, really positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I did I did read the article. It it did say that that season four was going to be gnarly. Um, <laughs> that it was it was going to be a gnarly first half first half of that story arc. So uh, yeah, yeah. And they also said that uh, Netflix said that one of the biggest reasons they renewed the show was because of the fan reaction. They noticed it. They heard the fans, uh, and they they heard the passion. And so I think honestly that the fans had a huge huge role to play in getting Netflix to pick that up. So well done, you listener, you. Yes. Well done. Yes. Well done. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, Pennyworth, Pennyworth. Just a really quick update Music. on Pennyworth, which if you recall is going to follow uh, Batman's loyal butler, Alfred, as a young man. It will start filming in the UK uh, toward the end of the year, fall, winter, sometime before 2018. Okay. Uh, it seems to me that filming in the UK is going to be important for that. Ed, does that, is that oh, yes? Oh, yes, yes, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, you know, he is British. Uh, he's supposed to be like SAS or like former SAS. So, like, yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. Uh, I, I, you know, based on the description, it was set in England. So, from the film there, you know, um, be interested to see how they make it look like it's the 1960s. Um. But uh, yeah, like this is actually happening. I, you know, this is one of the things I was most surprised at. But, you know, the fact that it got a series order straight off and they seem to be serious about it. All right, let's let's go for it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, it has a good pedigree, right? It's got some of the Gotham folks behind it. So I could see where yeah. they'd feel comfortable that those are people who know how to work in in that in those tones, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, moving on to the swamp thing. Ooh. I'm sorry, not the swamp thing. Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing okay. music. <laughs> Swamp Thing. Filming starts this fall in North Carolina. And I don't know, Ed, do you think North Carolina will be a decent stand-in for Louisiana? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's there's Swamp Land there. Um, yeah, it's a little surprising that they're not going to Louisiana. But, hey, I guess, I guess you follow the tax breaks. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, Nor North Carolina does have a lot of Swamp Land, so... Yeah, it's a, certainly they can make that work. And I suppose I probably will not be able to. Oh well, that's clearly North Carolina swamp. This is garbage. I, I don't <laughs> think I'm that discerning a consumer. So mm -hmm. uh, we also have a couple of bits of casting uh, that we hadn't talked about before. One of them is a smart, slick, and cunning villain in the vein of Lawrence Fishburne or Jeff Goldblum, uh, and it's the. Uh, comicbook.com article suggested that that could be General Avery Carlton Sunderland or Anton Arcane. Mm. So it could be his two biggest arch nemeses. Um, 
they, they really went out on a limb for that. Also, Lawrence Fishburne and Jeff Goldblum are two very different types. Like, <laughs> yes. Do you want Morpheus or do you want Dr. Ian Malcolm? I do like it's two different flavors of smart, slick, and cunning. I mean, that works for both of them, but you're right. Those are really different. But if they announce that they actually cast Lawrence Fishburne or Jeff Goldblum, how ecstatic would you be? Oh, that would be great. That would be great. Although, like, Jeff Goldblum is Anton Arcane. That is a, whoa, that is a huge flip because he is a very, very dark villain. Oh, very, I want, I want Jeff Goldblum to play a dark villain, like I, really like dark and nasty and evil and like ooh, ooh. Okay, maybe I don't want Jeff Goldblum ruined for me. As I'm talking, I'm realizing yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. This I'm, is like I'm when they to... cast when they cast Jeffrey Dean Morgan as Negan, and I was like, oh, oh no, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm uh, trying to I'm trying to think of someone who could, you know, like like who who would have been the archetype for Anton Arcane. But um yeah, yeah, that's that that that's a tough one. That is a tough one. But um Okay. I just want Jeff Goldblum to keep making Marvel movies, so <laughs> that's that's what I'm looking for. Uh the other bit of casting is for uh Abby's ex, Matthew Cable, uh described as a sheriff with anger issues. Okay. So, yeah, 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 and uh, all right. Uh, oh, yeah, yes, I was go. just gonna say that character also does uh, has had dealings with the Doom Patrol, so um, you just which is cool. That means that they have crossover potential, right? I mean, yeah. it's they're gonna be on the same network, so why not? Kind of, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, okay. Last bit of news, most exciting bit of news. We have news stories do, about do, 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 why do, do, the last man. Why? Music. And all of them say that Jodie Foster is in talks to play Yorick's mother. Yes. It was just- Edward O'Hare TBD. I've never wanted anything more in my life than Jodie Foster to play Yorick's mother in Why the Last Man on FX. Oh, my God. Yeah. It, that is perfect casting. And it's also like it's she makes one movie like every three or four years now. Um, you know, and that, that is, that is serious casting. Now, granted her last movie, Hotel Artemis, which came out recently, I wasn't so hot on, but she's great at it. Um, and, and she's, she's one of those powerhouse actresses, um, that, you know, really get, gets, gets stuff done. I think this, this would be really cool. This would be, uh, really great to see her on it, on a, on a TV show. Um, yeah, she's not done TV before, correct? No, no, she's directed TV. She directed, a, mm-hmm. I think, an episode of House of Cards, um, and that 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 would also be to see if she gets involved behind the scenes, um, you know, because she she has that. She, what was she directed? Nell, um, The Beaver, which was a movie that was a oh, lot. Oh yeah, which, which I I I think that movie got a lot of bad press just because of the the whole thing with Mel Gibson surrounding it that I I think I don't think that movie would have been panned as much if it had gotten a fair shake um but she's she had which what was what was the last one she did with George Clooney uh Money Monster um but you know she she is a solid director um you know who, who tries out different things and I I actually think that you know, if if she if she does an episode or two of of Why the Last Man, that would be a very interesting take. Um, well, and it depends on how quickly the the show moves through the book material for how long her character would be on, because that's a show that really does hop geographically around the world. So I'll oh, be yeah. I'll be curious to see you know how much does season one cover. But I I don't want to get into spoiler spoilers. But York's mother is a government official, uh, and Jodie Foster would be an amazing steely muckety muck in the government. Oh my god, and she's somebody. Why the Last Man, I don't think, is is perfect in its, some of its depictions of, of women for being a, sh- a book that was almost entirely populated by women. And Jodie Foster is somebody who I feel like br- brings an elevated, intelligent feminist perspective to things. And so I, I, I don't see Jodie Foster signing on to something that's going to be like, cat fights and without men, what are we? And like, Why the Last Man isn't like that. But this show could veer in directions that would make me nervous. 
And Jodie Foster, she's just one of those names that I think if you put her on there, I trust her guidance and her judgment and her her influence to not let that happen. So I guess what I'm saying is in Jodie, I trust. I will be devastated if this doesn't happen, but that's okay. It's cool. I'm not putting all my eggs in a TV basket here. It's fine. I've got other things in my life. It's cool. But uh, I'm hoping that this announcement is, I mean, that th this is actual news and it's far enough along that that's why it's being reported. And it's not one of those early rumors that is based on nothing because it really did get picked up by a lot of different outlets today. So fingers crossed. Jodie Foster. Here's hoping. All right. That was it for the news, right? That is it. All right. So it's time for our retro pick. Ah, oh, so we, we had two episodes, so I'm just going to read the, the recaps back to back. And then we'll talk about we'll talk about them as one episode because it's one story. Um, so here goes. Batman, the animated series. Episode aired September 8th, 1992. Feet of Clay, part one. Lucius Fox was attacked by an imposter posing as Bruce Wayne who wanted to bury secrets about the corrupt business practices of Roland Daggett. Actor Matt Hagen had become addicted to a skin cream Daggett developed to hide facial injuries Hagen suffered in an accident. Last minute reveal, Teddy found Matt's car and discovered he had been turned into the amorphous blob we know as Clayface. Episode aired September 9th, 1992. Feet of Clay, Part 2. Batman sought to clear Bruce Wayne's name and waited for someone to attack Lucius Fox in his hospital bed. Matt Hagen resigned himself to the fact that he would be Clayface forever, learned he could take a defined form for brief moments with intense concentration, and planned his revenge against Roland Daggett. Last minute reveal, Clayface's body crumbled to dust. His friend Teddy said goodbye and a woman cackled in the street. This is my favorite Batman the Animated Series episode so far. I loved this. Yeah. Yeah, this was, you know, you know what? It, it, this is a really good episode. It has a similar arc to Heart of Ice uh, and even to um, On Leather Wings to an extent because it's, it's the, the villain is, is tragic. I, I was going to say, I felt like of, of everybody we've seen so far, he has the most uh, relatable and tragic backstory. I mean, he it's not like he set out to turn into this. He was trying to hang on to his career. And, you know, it's I, I felt for him. I just I felt for him. Maybe yeah. it was the voice acting. I don't know. But I felt for him. <laughs> oh, oh, let me just do a quick rundown of the, the credits here. So this episode was uh, part one is directed by Dick Seabast. Part two was directed by Kevin Altieri. Um, story by Marv Wolfman and Michael Reeves. The and they they traded off uh, episodes. Marv Wolfman is is a legendary comic book writer um, who wrote Cri uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, uh, as as well as many other story arcs. He he was the creator of uh, he was the guy first person to write Dick Grayson becoming Nightwing. Um, and the, the 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 voice cast in this is incredible. You have Edward Asner as Roland Daggett. You have Brock Pete, uh, who you know uh, the voice of um, in Up, the star of Up, and uh, played Lou Grant on the Mary Tyler Moore Show. Uh, Brock Peters voices Lucius Fox, um, who many will know uh, in To Kill a Mockingbird, and he's also a general in a couple of Star Trek movies. Uh, Ed Begley Jr. Uh, voiced Germs, uh, and he's in everything. Everything you've ever seen has Ed Begley Jr. in it. Um, <laughs> specifically, uh, I don't know, St. Elsewhere. Uh, a lot of the uh, Arrested movies. Development when he had alopecia and had to wear the, the hairpiece. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. But my favorite part of his is when he plays the hotel manager in Best in Show. Um <laughs> I don't know why they had to skewer the goat in the room, uh, but <laughs> we couldn't get the smell of smoke out of the drapes for months. Um, <laughs> but uh, Ron Perlman voiced uh, Clayface, Matt Hagen, 
uh, who you know from Hellboy and the original Beauty and the Beast television series. Um, Dick Gaudier voiced Teddy Lupus. You know him as Jaime in the original Get Smart. And Scott Valentine voiced Raymond Bell. He was Nick on Family Ties. Um, do you recognize any of those people? <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I, I know we don't do this for the other shows, but I just feel like the, the voice actors that they pull out for these small parts is really incredible. Like, like the best character actors you could have found in 1992. <laughs> yes, agreed. <laughs> uh-huh. Now, now, Sarah, t- go, let's go into detail here. Tell me what you, what you thought of this episode, of the story arc. I have never been more scared of Batman then when he is threatening Clayface and, and or I'm sorry, not Clayface, but uh, um, the science guy uh, with the infectious disease, oh, Scarlet man. Fever, and he puts it on the shelf and he's pounding and it gets closer and closer. And I'm just like, dang, Batman's not playing. So scary. And of course, it's just it's just harmless seawater. Batman would never actually do that to somebody. But that was stone cold. That was really good writing. I, I really liked the... Uh, how terrifying Batman was. Well, also, like, when he <laughs> he takes Bell and, like, picks him up with the Batwing and, like, is hurling him around Gotham. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver Queen, eat your heart out. <laughs> <laughs> you got nothing. You if, you if you have moral quandaries about the way you torture people, you have nothing. On the way Batman man- manipulates his uh, his his wit- his <laughs> witnesses, but at the same time, we we had a scene where Kevin Conroy had to use this amazingly soothing tone, and I I need a like rock you to sleep Kevin Conroy audio track because <laughs> it was it was so like yes calm <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 every everything about these. Um, you know, uh, I I love the end surprise me. I I just I it it actually did throw me for a loop. I truly thought he had died. Um, I I enjoyed uh, that that whole the the morphing and the shape shifting there at the end was really upsetting and the mm-hmm. ugh. also yeah. that that ending had you know also had an end of Terminator Two vibe. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know with with him going in and out of his different personas and you know all the people he transformed into over the episode. Um, now this, this is another, you know, obscure villain, um, who has a lot of play in the comics, but hasn't really, you know, translated at least into live action. He, you know, he was in an episode of Gotham, but you know, not nowhere near in this form. And I don't even remember that episode of Gotham. What season was that? That was season two. Uh, you might not. Um, that may have been the season I hopscotched around a little bit to get caught up for this very podcast. Yeah, yeah, and all basically they did was they 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 molded his face into into Jim Gordon's. Like you know, you you, you didn't see Clayface in any way. It was just mm. I do remember that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that was not the berserker joy that I got from watching this. No, no, no. And this is like this is a villain that. I still don't know if they could pull this off believably, you know, with CGI <laughs> um, and have it be as scary. And and as you know, again, this this is this was a scary episode. This one had dramatic stakes. You know, this this did not feel like a kid's show to me. You know. Yeah, I agree. What what, what they did to Hagen, uh, what the Daggett people did to him was brutal. I mean, that felt to me like, uh, you know joker in the first batman movie and just the the wholehearted yeah we're just gonna dump chemicals on him until he's dead yikes <laughs> you're right that's that was dark for kids fair yeah yeah but let's hear it for teddy the world's most loyal assistant <laughs> no you're gonna be fine you can come back it's great you're gonna be great you're gonna make a mint no teddy <laughs> maybe no <laughs> oh it's 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 over buddy oh <laughs> I guess he just didn't want the paychecks to stop. No, but you can still you can still do it, man. You can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just oh. Just even the the when Batman's electrocuting the little blob at the end and it's going through all the shapes. Just just the I enjoyed the physics of it. It was fun. It was it was fun to watch. Maybe that's what I like. This was just visually fun to watch. Clayface do his thing. Yeah, and you know Batman is 
he's the detective in this show. Like you really mm-hmm. see that he's never stops poking and prodding and trying to figure out exactly what happened. You know, like mo- most, you know, you, the the thought with most other TV cops would just leave it alone at that point. And he's not convinced. He still wants to know exactly how that went down. You know, he's he's not just satisfied with with taking everything on face value. Um, and I and he figures it out. That's the cool thing too. He t- too late, but he figures out. Oh wait, we were duped. <laughs> dun dun dun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I you know one of the things I really like about this show is that it's not the CGI, the computer animation that you get now, which is fine. I mean that's that's the style that we have now. But I just love the old school animation on this. Yeah. If that makes me an old person, so be it. Yeah, I yeah I wish we had that more. We're gonna get it. We're gonna get it in Young Justice coming up. Um, you know that's that's still, you know that's still gonna be hand drawn animation. Um, and I I don't know what they're doing with Harley Quinn. I think that's that's also gonna be hand drawn. Um, oh, I read something, and forgive me if I'm jumping the gun on this, but Harley Quinn was created for this series. Yes, yes. Holy she was. shit, Ed! I had no idea. That's that's really cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Harley Quinn. Paul Dini, um, the actress who voices her, I forget her name, begins with an A, um, Arlene something, but uh, she wrote the movie Pitch Perfect. Anyway, um, Arlene Sorkin, maybe? I can't, I can't remember, but um, he saw, an, saw her on an episode of a, a soap opera in a Harlequin Quinn costume, and just that stuck in his head so he just wrote this character in just as a one-off um you know just as like a background character and then slowly she got a voice and then you know they started using her more and more and she became so popular that yeah she they started using her in the comics um it was arlene sorkin good memory oh wow wow i can't believe wow Damn, I was. Not- I can't. Come on, Ed. We can all believe that you knew that name. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody here doubted you could pull that name out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Now we haven't met Harley Quinn yet. Um, yeah, I didn't mean to jump the gun. I was just on Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah I went to Wikipedia. <laughs> but- Let's see. Um, I super enjoyed the symbolism when Clayface and Batman were fighting at the end. Uh, Clayface smashed the camera. I, I thought. I mean, that was just. They don't have to do little things like symbolism in terms of what he destroys because of what he's become, but that really worked for me. Um, my husband, who's watching very patiently watching this with me, he's seen all these episodes fifty times, um, pointed out that you know you said Marv Wolfman's just a, a monster comics guy, but I mean that's what makes this show so good, right? That you have these incredible comics writers who are writing for the show and i imagine that's what elevates this a little bit and gives us scary batman <laughs> oh yeah and symbolism and things like that yeah because they take the character like th- that's the one element about this show that even even some of the movies don't land uh you know is that it, it plays it straight you know, even though it may be a, a ridiculous concept, the characters accept the premise and it's grounded, you know, and and you it it's relatable. You know, it, it's it's the kind of thing where like if this was a real thing, this is how it would go down. And the and the emotional reactions are honest and sincere. And well, and we were in kind of a sincere time in 92, right? We didn't have the self reference We didn't have Scream yet. We didn't have that looking at the camera and giving a quick wink that we do now. And I think that shows in this as well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh, all right. Um, is there anything, anything more you wanted to touch on? Or do you know what I would have given for a death scene like this? <laughs> oh, oh! I guess the last thing is I do have in all caps in my notes. Does Clayface come back? Don't tell me. I don't want to know. But that was I just the they set him up for a return villain, and I don't know if this is the kind of show that does that or not. But if he does, I'd be super excited. Ooh, okay, all right. So you you ready for next week's episode? I am so ready. So next week's episode coincidentally 
is uh if is the next episode if you're watching on Amazon Prime it's volume 1 episode 22 and it's titled Joker's Favor. Ooh. Joker's Favor. What do you think that might be about, Sarah? The penguin. Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll see if I'm right. <laughs> cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So uh, that just leaves us with our winners for the week. Uh, you know, this is – I feel like I'm phoning this in. But I'm phoning it in on a landline because my winner of the week is the 90s. <laughs> because, Ed, let's be honest. We reference the 90s a lot in this podcast but uh, supergirl i feel like snuck in some references to ghost and the terminator mm -hmm. we we dropped the terminator with our retro pick i brought up carrie strug every voice actor you named for us in batman the animated series i'm pretty sure peaked in like 1991 so i'm just gonna say in this particular episode the 1990s were king and i salute them all right all right my winner for the week was uh clean slates um, I, I like how everyone's going to be getting a fresh start next season. You know, as you said, John is going to be, you know, walking the earth like Kane and Kung Fu. Um, Alex has a new job and is looking into adopting, uh, mon and, and Wynn are going off into the future. Brainy starting his new job in Wynn's old job, um, at the DEO. You, uh, you know, and, you know. I, I to me like the way that they laid out everything and resolved everything uh i think i think i i'm now of the cw shows i think the the one on firmest ground uh at this point you know looks like it might be supergirl um you know and it it, it seems lean and ready to go well it certainly has the most manageable call list at this point <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. Uh, all right. All right. I think I think that's the DC TV report for this week. Um, uh, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at Edward O'Hare TBD. And I'm at Sarah Netzley, S-A-R-A-N-E-T-Z-L-E-Y. And you can follow the show on Twitter at DC TV report. Uh, send along your emails to DC TV at wicked theory dot com. Uh, also, be sure to subscribe to your to our show on your uh, podcast app of choice, uh, which now includes Spotify. Uh, DC TV report is available on Spotify. Um, and here's where I confess that I am an old and I don't understand how podcasts work on Spotify, but if that is how you choose to get your audio content, God bless. There we are. Spotify it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And check out our sister shows, uh, the wicked theory podcast and preacher versus preacher. Uh, this has been a Wicked Theory Studios production. Executive producer Bill Sweeney. Visit us at wickedtheory.com. Shazam, everybody. Shazam. Shazam. Shazam.